Thanks. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. It's, um, it's really good to be here. Um, so I wanted to talk uh, today about, um, um, in a general sense, some of the, uh, the really interesting and, um, well, interesting to me, cool things that uh, are going on in terms of um, radical new ways that uh, big scale science is being performed today and the new scientific instruments being made possible by equally interesting but somewhat less sort of um, attention grabbing transformations in the way that scientists are harnessing compute power. So um, I, I think it's somewhat obvious where we're going with that direction from the title, but um, but I really, really what I wanted to talk about, uh, given we're here in Bristol, is is about how our city and our industry are working at the forefront of this transformation. It may not look like it from the city, but we are up there on this, and I want to tell the story a little bit about how that has happened. So um, uh, that that's me. Um, that's the uh, uh, Trifan in uh, in North Wales in Snowdonia. It's um, it's the Adam and Eve uh, rocks on the top of the uh, the summit. And if you ever like to feel exposure, um, I recommend doing this jump. It's also great if you're changing jobs. If you're looking for a slide with like a visual metaphor in it, um, it's also uh, good for that. So, I first came to Bristol 1992. Um, uh, as a 17 year old um, working in a year off before university and um, and ever since then I have largely worked in this city for industries which have really been stepping stones towards the point where we are now where I am now and so we've been working on creating um, world beating and uh, genre defining machines in this city uh, using using technologies which are invented right here so um, uh, some of those, some of the favourites ones. So when I was 17, I worked at Mako. I was working on vector matrix libraries for graphics processors. Alpha processor is, well, the alpha was um, the, the original 100 watt beast. Um, and, um, and we go on. I mean, some of these uh, machines here uh, built networks that changed the world in terms of what was possible at a hardware level. And, and, and we go on. And now, now today, Cray is across the water from here. and um, with a couple of um, uh, colleagues, we have created a company based on the ideas and the principles that essentially we incubated uh, within the research group in Cray. And we've been going for about uh, three years, just coming up to three years now, on this new strategy as well. How do we make high performance computing environments, the classical scientific computing challenges, how do we make those work in a cloud context without actually paying a fortune to Amazon or, or some such in a similar way. So, so we're really looking at like the Linux of Amazon Web Services and how do we make that run really, really fast. So I want to lay the scene uh, by taking a, a small step back. Um, this is a project that I'm not directly involved in. Um, I do go to meetings where people talk about it and, and I know that they are doing similar things to what we are doing. Uh, this is LIGO. So, this is a machine, um, there's actually two of these in uh, different corners of the United States. This is the one in Georgia. It is a um, right-angled tube, vacuum tube, uh, four kilometers long on each side. And they shine a laser down it, uh, across a mirror at the other end and back again. And they use it to measure very slight changes in the distance between the two ends of the tube. And what they're looking for is the implied presence of gravity waves. So this machine is the dawn of a whole new branch in experimental physics. And it was made in 2015. And it's testament to the perseverance and inventiveness and sheer bloody mindedness of a group of scientists who had been working towards this project for 40 years. And it went on in service in, um, in 2015. It's designed to detect the very, very most massive uh, gravity events in the universe. And in particular, they are looking for the, the moment when two black holes will collide with each other, smash into each other, and emit vast amounts of energy. So um, uh, I think you've probably guessed from the title slide, I like The Hitchhiker's Guide. And I know that you're all thinking about um, eddies in the space-time con continuum here. It's really looking for catching those sort of wobbling jelly moments in space-time where, 
where the, the aftershock of these massive events will actually be stretching and compressing um, the world around us. So it's designed for these massive cosmic events, uh, and it had been operating for 10 days, and they got the first one. So I think they've had a few more since then. The energy involved in these things is absolutely extreme. No one would have noticed it, though. So that's a lot of energy. Um, this uh, sort of the biggest fusion bombs, H bombs, that have been let off are about the order of 50 megatons, uh, which is the equivalent uh, matter used up of about two kilograms. The collision of the black holes that they detected gave off the equivalent of three solar masses of energy. For a tenth of a second, it was brighter than anything else in the universe put together, everything else in the universe put together. And you wouldn't have noticed, but for the gravity waves that passed through the LIGO machine and contracted it in one direction and expanded it in the other by one thousandth of the radius of an atomic nucleus. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so gravity waves are, well, obviously, they're not light. They're not magnetism. They're not radio. They're not sound. They are an entirely new way in which we can perceive the universe around us. And we have never noticed them. And we are just now starting to hear faintly the very loudest of those things. There is a big problem, though. This machine, the LIGO machine, can detect only the biggest bangs, only the most massive events in gravity. And that's because gravity waves are absolutely enormous. So the problem is that some of them can have the wavelength of the entire solar system. They could be nanohertzes, so they could be taking many, many seconds to, to pass by. This massive machine, the LIGO machine, while it's pretty amazing, is a bit too small. So we're going to talk about another machine which is going to be able to detect them a little bit more effectively on, the, on a larger scale. So obviously this is Einstein, and, um, and that's an artist's impression of gravity. Um, how do we detect these? So the approach is that we reach out across the universe. And instead of having a, an arm in a vacuum tube that's four kilometers long, we look to a pulsar across there, which is beating a thousand times a second with astonishing regularity. And then we find another pulsar in another direction at right angles, which is also beating very, very fast. And the idea is then that our, the arms of our instrument become light years long. And then we can detect the very, very massive passing by, uh, um, propagations of gravity waves and uh, we use what the wonders of uh, or one of the wonders of deep space in order to catch another one so the machine that's going to do this is a really ambitious class a new class of radio telescope which is called the square kilometer array it doesn't exist yet uh, these are actually prototypes uh, these dishes they're in Australia um, the interesting thing about uh, radio astronomy I, I read recently was that um, the amount of energy that these dishes receive. So the energy that's not from this planet, the extraterrestrial energy uh, received by all radio telescopes from all time, it was once said, is the same as the energy of a snowflake hitting the ground. All of those dishes, everything that they have received is that small. That was 1980. And there's a lot more telescopes uh, around now. So we might actually be up to two or even three snowflakes. But still, these dishes are astonishingly sensitive. And they generate vast amounts of data. They are experiments on a massive, massive scale. So the, the, the square kilometer array is actually two distinct, uh, slightly different instruments. Uh, one of them is the um, the one in the Australian desert, the orange one. Uh, that's from above. Uh, those are they look a bit like Christmas trees or radio antennae. Uh, there's 130,000 of them arrayed across a very radio silent region in the Australian desert. They detect low frequencies. Uh, on the right, we have um, uh, the prototype for the dishes in uh, the South African desert, uh, which detect mid frequencies. Um, these 
two separate distinct instance, in, instruments generate astonishing amounts of data. So after signal processing at the site, each of these um, devices is going to be de generating just under a terabyte a second of data feed, of processed data, which then has to be hold, held and buffered for about six hours while it is correlated and analysed and formed into observations. For that, we're going to need just under 30 to 40 petabytes of the fastest RAM or storage buff, buffer storage that we can get. That means about uh, 20 terabytes of this new memory technology in every node in the machine. And the processing power is about the same as the biggest computer you can buy today, uh, which would be one of the ones in the US Energy Labs. Unfortunately, we don't have the money, or the SKA does not have the money to buy that machine, and nor does it have anything like the power budget to run it. So thankfully, we're going to be, um, we've got a few years. It has to go into production by 2023. Um, so there is a bit of time in order for technology to evolve a couple of generations and in order for creative uses of this kind of infrastructure in order to manage a vast compute resource requirement and a tiny power budget. And that's where we come in. So um, my company's been involved with a um, project at Cambridge University, which is a performance prototyping platform. Uh, this is a project we've been working on for about a year and a half now. It's called Alaska. Uh, you can see the pun. And um, the idea of that, this machine is that it's actually a rack of current generation cutting edge technologies, a whole diverse range of, uh, of kit. And what we are briefed to do is to create frameworks to enable the scientists and the researchers who are building the final production design, enable them to determine which of today's technologies are contenders and which ones are lemons. So we want to be able to create an objective means of comparing different performance frameworks and different pieces of hardware and different systems for managing the whole show. So all of that processing has to be coordinated in a way that is as efficient as possible because when you have 125 petaflops if you lose 1%, that's like a machine in the top 100 of the world, and you're just throwing it away in terms of inefficiency. So, so we need to offer the scientists working on this machine a nice way of making these kinds of performance-centric comparisons. A level playing field uh, for those software experiments. So uh, the way that we do that, uh, so here's a, a few of the things we have. So we've got Obviously, we've got some GPU nodes, um, lots of uh, volatile, uh, non-volatile memory. We use some 64-bit um, ARM processors in a storage appliance uh, with the system. Uh, we've got a bunch of fabrics, so um, InfiniBand, um, high-speed Ethernet, and, and the like. Uh, we've got a couple of nodes with um, a half a terabyte of RAM. And, um, but the interesting one for, for us, for our company, is this last one. So we are using OpenStack in a bare metal framework for managing this environment. And um, the idea is that OpenStack gives us flexibility because it provides a cloud-like interface. But it's running on kit in a data center in Cambridge. So we have the physical environment, and we have a cloud-like interface. And we run it bare metal so that we don't incur any performance overhead, whilst at the same time, laying on all of this application dynamism and flexibility in order to let the scientists get performance and then re-spin the machine and try something else. So I guess lots of people are in the room and across the conference probably think, well, well uh, why don't you go with AWS? So I guess that the, the interesting, that is, a, that is a very pertinent question and large parts of the machine are anticipated to be met by the public cloud. Um, but in some cases, that doesn't really fit with the situation of the institutions that are running things like the SKA and these other large-scale science problem, problems, because what they have is continuous, boundless demand for compute. They have readily available, highly skilled staff, 
and they don't have very much money. So they have to be resourceful and they have to be inventive. And the public cloud analogy kind of breaks down. It's like saying to someone who's a taxi, uh, so, so is a, a, um, who drives all day for their work, well, why don't you just buy a ta take a taxi instead? You know, People don't do that. And they make the same kind of cost trade-off with, um, uh, with their cars and with their computers. And so they say, well, there is a cutoff point where if I need a computer resource for this scale all the time, for this amount of time, it's actually more economical for me to learn how to do it myself to buy the kit and to run it myself. And that's the way that these institutions operate. And that is why OpenStack fits in here as being essentially like a poor man's AWS, but also an AWS which I run inside my data center at my cost points and configured just how I want it. So OpenStack in general, uh, OpenStack in particular, cloud in general, is still pretty cool though, and is transformative to the way that these people want to manage their resources. Um, obviously, the, the, the nice thing is that we can, for different science projects, we can create different resources, configure infrastructure, and then build upon it the kind of workflow management that those people want to be running. The, the point is, or the problem is though, if you're just recreating this kind of high performance computing, batch oriented environment that you had before, you're not really taking advantage of cloud in the way that you could be. So that's like the first step of a transformation. And we need to really think about what else can we do to make a full advantage of a cloud infrastructure environment. So as well as your high performance computing environment, uh, we could be running data intensive analytics with the usual stacks. We could be using containerized workflows as well. And um, all of these points are really addressing what you might call the, the long tail of high performance computing. These environments where you would have a, um, a batch queued, high performance sort of supercomputer oriented environment generating, churning out loads of data. And then you'd have data analytics and other things either before it or after it in order to make sense of what it's doing or to generate data for the next simulation run. And this kind of environment, this kind of symbiotic environment, works really well. And people are finding that if we buy a dedicated high-performance compute facility, then we can run OpenStack Cloud next to it for everything else around it to feed it and be fed by it. So this is an emerging model, and, um, and it's becoming quite a dominant model across research computing and science that using cloud without actually going to out to cloud is really, really working out well for these people. Now we talked about um, the SKA machine, that's bare metal. So actually, instead of running virtual machines and hypervisors, we actually provision the compute nodes themselves with the software images, the, the QCOW2 files, the other things that we're running, in order to run the applications and spawn the applications, bring them up and configure them in cloud-like ways, but on bare metal. Pretty cool stuff. So the way that's done, um, we, through the magic of Ansible, we speak to um, OpenStack, we orchestrate the hardware, we stick an operating system on it, others are available, uh, and then a little bit more Ansible, and we build these nice sort of um, software environments upon the bare infrastructure to create the platform in the same way that you would be creating a web application or a Redis deployment, SQL server, or a SQL database, or any such thing, only now we're running research computing applications like Slurm, the Job Queue Manager, high performance file systems like BGFS, and a load of other OpenStack services to support the whole thing and to integrate with the whole thing to add extra value and take advantage of being embedded in a cloud-like environment, being a little bit more special than, than we would be if we were running inside of a conventional compute environment. So, uh, we talked about um, a bit about discovering gravity. Uh, this machine is another project that we've been involved in. Uh, this one's for discovering dark energy and, uh, and dark matter. Uh, it's actually a pair of space probes, and they're going to be launched in the early 2020s. And what they're aiming to do is to use gravitational lensing and, and other technologies in order to infer the presence of invisible things within the universe. So right now, the project is, is not launched. 
the detectors are just being designed. But what they need is huge amounts of compute capacity in order to model what the detectors are going to be seeing and to work out whether the technology that they're using actually makes sense and is going to produce the right things. And this actually introduces the next stage in the story in that we have a lot of OpenStack users in scientific computing, a lot of people who are bought into this kind of um, flexible cloud-like compute environment. And now they're starting to federate. So they're starting to use cloud technologies to create hybrid and multi-site clouds, but all focused around delivering scientific computing applications, other high performance and data intensive workflows as well. So this is a project that's been going on um, over the summer. And um, what the Euclid, um, Euclid Consortium wants, they're based in Edinburgh, and, um, and they're looking for a trans uh, sort of a, 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 a trans-site um, federation across UK resources and they make they're basically uh, they're, they're consuming resources from a project which is emerging called um, called iris and iris is created by the UK science and technologies <coughs> facilities council and what it's um, what it's about is creating a pooled resource across many research institutions and leading universities in this country in order to offer high performance cloud in a dynamic way using academic networks and academic infrastructure in order to give projects like uh, Euclid um, on-demand compute and vast amounts of data movement uh, in order to meet their needs as they in their transient needs. So um, aside from um, being slightly performance oriented this machine also has some cloud-like features like Ceph file systems, but also some high performance computing features like Lustre file systems, the high performance parallel file system. Um, it takes some technologies from CERN. So the CERN VMFS is a means of distributing data across multiple sites, which was uh, developed in order to feed the, um, uh, the CERN computing grid. And at the same time, we are deploying the whole thing using cloud technologies like Ansible. And, um, and the OpenStack APIs. So we're getting this really kind of nice hybridization, cross-fertilization of using the cloud methods and, and techniques to break down the sort of ossified, rigid uh, ways of deploying high-performance compute environments, but at the same time using high-performance computing environments and adapting cloud in infrastructure in order to run those really well. And what we get out of it is something which is a real uh, design winner for, for OpenStack and also for research institutions too. So I guess the next question is, well, what's the point in terms of, um, in terms of performance? What's the benefit? And this is a really interesting question because you choose your own adventure with that. So um, when we first started on this journey, we had to prove the context and the, um, the use case. And we did a bit of research on how cloud infrastructure does networking, as an example. So this was a graph that I generated. We get two VMs running on different machines. So this is virtualized. And then we use a networking benchmark tool, iPerf, to blast data from one to the other. One TCP stream, how much bandwidth can we get out of it? This machine had a 50 gig ethernet. So we have 50 at the top. And we were looking at all the different ways that we could set up cloud networking in order to change the infrastructure, the plumbing between these two VMs and work out what the benefit was and the trade-off was of each of these different strategies. So there's a few here. Um, if we installed OpenStack out the box and we did nothing, we got about a gigabit and a half out of our 50 gig link. And then if we tuned the BIOSes and we tuned the network cards, we still got about a gigabit and a half. Uh, so that wasn't a very good start. Um, but then we did a little bit of analysis and we realized that um, the CentOS kernel that we we're using, a three series kernel, was not able to exploit all of the hardware capabilities of these really nice network cards that we had. So this is the kind of getting into the plumbing under, underneath the VMs. And uh, so we upgraded the kernel to one which would help manage VXLAN networks or, or tenant networks. And that got us up to about 11 gigabits a second with a four series kernel. Um, 
And then we started to look at the performance of the machine and the way that the processor was being configured at boot time. So when the processor sprang to life, and if you turn off all of the sort of the hyper-threading, the sort of cloud cores, and, and you just run with um, uh, one thread per core, per CPU core, uh, you get a really tasty uplift in performance, which is this purpley, lumpy line. And then the next thing we did was if we actually then take the processors inside the virtual machine and map them into the processors on the physical machine so they're not jumping around like snakes in a sack, then we get a lovely level performance here. And actually, the other thing we get here is very low latency. So we get a sort of step change in the latency that's going on. So when people start to talk about the long tail latencies of their processing and so on, at a very a sort of much more tighter scale, that's the kind of effect that was at play here. Um, the next thing we do is um, we have a machine with two sockets in the hypervisor. So there's plenty of CPU cores, but spread across two. And if we pass through the awareness of the two sockets, um, we're up to about 24 gigabits a second. So we're at the halfway point there. And what happens next is if we then start to take advantage of just not doing like the, the software offloads and the software para-virtualized processes that you would get with a classic virtualized environment like on Google Compute, um, if you go for hardware offloads like um, what they call SRIOV, so this is passing a network card actually into the VM so it can talk to it direct without going through the <coughs> hypervisor, uh, we get up to about 42 gigabits a second. So there's a transformative leap there. The other interesting thing there is the amount of work that the hypervisor is doing, which is essentially stolen work from what the processors are in the application are doing, goes down by a, a huge amount. So this is, this is a big thing. Uh, and then if we actually take away all the VMs and the hypervisor and everything else and run on the bare metal, uh, we get 46 gigabits a second out of a peak limit after protocol of 48. So networks are pretty fast when you have good network cards. But what we've got here is a, a whole spectrum of trade-offs. You choose your own adventure. And down at the bottom, we've got machines which are totally flexible. Uh, you can migrate them, you can shelve them, you can do all kinds of stuff. Up at the top here, you've got machines which are totally inflexible. You boot them up and they run, and then at the end of the day, you can turn them off. And that's pretty much the amount of control you get on the running system. Somewhere in the middle is the right balance point for what people want to do. And that, of course, depends on how much they are prepared to say, I want to perform versus I want to be able to manage it as well. So the uh, the science people, you know, they, they're a bit hair-shirted. They can put up with this stuff and very happily do so. And the public cloud and the sort of kind of um, non-intensive network workloads and so on, they're quite happy down here running on optimized software infrastructure without actually uh, compromising on, uh, on flexibility. So that was a pretty interesting study into how we can actually use cloud technologies in a high-performance high compute environment and make sense of it and whether it's actually worth it. And the answer is, well, maybe. It kind of depends. A project we've been working on this year at uh, Cambridge University has been a good deal more demanding. And this is a machine which is the, the largest computer in academia in the UK today. It's bigger than the Cray system at Edinburgh, the UK's national compute facility. And um, it's about 2.2 petaflops. So it's also about a hundredth of the size of the SKA requirement. This, um, this machine is, uh, is pretty fast and it's pretty good. But when you get a huge amount of compute and a huge amount of network, the bottleneck just moves to the data. And what we have here is this high performance, high capacity file system down here. And we have um, getting on for 1500 high performance servers at the top here and a very large, very capable network in the middle. The difficulty is when everyone who's running on these things wants to get data from down here, this file system cannot deliver on a vast spectrum of workloads. 
So they introduce this thing in the middle, the data accelerator. It's effectively what's known as a burst buffer or hot tier storage. The idea behind that is that when you're running your application, when a scientist is running a compute job, they will be telling the, um, the queuing manager, the workload queue, ah, I, I need access to this files, these files in this directory. And then when their, pr their job progresses towards the front of the queue and it becomes runnable, um, a process will, will create a file system on these high performance flash nodes here and transfer in the data that they want from the Lustre storage into the high performance file system, then mount the file system as though it was their workspace. And then they can blast the data out into their workspace. It's local, or, or it's, it's NVMe running over a high performance fabric. It's about as fast as you can get in today's money. And, and then at the end of the job, when the job is complete, it gets drained out of here back into the file system and no one is any the wiser that they had access to this high tiered, high performance tiered thing. So what's required of this piece in the middle is quite interesting because now we've got to be creating file systems and storage servers and clusters on the fly, on demand. And that sounds so cloudy. It sounds so dynamic. And so the whole thing is achieved um, with the right hooks and triggers from the workload manager using technologies like Etcetra D and Ansible and so on in order to uh, create and manage file systems on here in a dynamic way and manage the appearance and di disappearance and the failures and whatnot. So this machine is another example of how high performance computing and um, cloud technologies can bring together to make something which is slightly better than what, I, what either of them is really coping with or dealing with at the moment anyway. Is it any good? It certainly is. So these graphs are, I'll, I'll just explain them. So um, these graphs are measured on the theoretical capacity that can be realized. This is the network. So if we make a burst buffer, a uh, one of these uh, storage on the fly with 24 servers, so um, each of them has 12 NVMEs in, then we get uh, the network capacity is about 600 gigabytes a second in and out of that storage file system. But the write capacity of the combined effect of all of those NVMEs is about 250 gigabytes a second. The file system achieves about 247 gigabytes a second out of what's, what's possible. So we're getting 96% of the performance that we would get if we ran a process on the storage node and wrote the data ourselves using a file system benchmark. So the, uh, the raw achievable performance of this machine, we are seeing 96% of that at the application across the network. On the reads, uh, the number, the efficiency is a bit lower, but the numbers are much higher because of obviously they're asymmetric in terms of the read and write performance. So we see over 500 gigabytes a second delivered from the file system to the application when it's launched and prov provisioned in this way. It's pretty cool stuff. So we're not the first people by any means to be thinking about how cloud and scientific compute and high performance computing all merge together. Um, there's clear precedents and, and one of them obviously is, is the, uh, the CERN computing grid. This is, um, this is actually the tape robot at CERN. Um, we went to the data center earlier this summer and I can say it's, it's not a looker, um, photogenically wise. So, um, but the tape robot's pretty cool. And uh, another take on uh, scale out storage perhaps, you get about 10 petabytes per meter and you can just make the track as long as you like. So, uh, so it scales out nicely in that way. I think they've got about 200 petabytes in this machine at the moment. And the CERN cloud is all delivered on site in two places um, using OpenStack as their, um, as their infrastructure management. So they, they are essentially the poster children of this kind of methodology of mingling cloud technologies and, um, and um, high performance computing, or in this case, high throughput computing. 
CERN is interesting. They face a similar kind of challenge to the SKA, which is that they are about to go through, they've just, they've just shut down, and they're going through a multi-year upgrade to the beam power at CERN. Uh, the high, luminos high luminosity upgrade is going to increase tenfold the energy going around the ring, the 27 kilometer ring in the collider. And that is going to create a problem for them because the kit they have today, vast though it is, is about 50 to 100 times too small in order to service the new beam. So CERN also has a bit of a problem, like the SKA does, on managing the enormity of the scale of the compute problem in order to service the detectors that they're working with. But they're bright guys. I have good faith in them, and I'm sure that they're going to work it out. Um, <laughs> so that's probably enough on, on physics. Um, you can get too much on physics, I think. And um, But I was going to sum up with the um, my favorite slide, which is uh, which is NASA's image of, of the entire universe and all time. Um, but um, what I think is interesting is that all of the, or many of the um, really, really captivating experiments going on today, or about to go on, around understanding the nature of the universe and these things like gravity, Big Bang, dark matter and dark energy, they all seem to be at a large scale turning to cloud computing and in particular OpenStack computing in order to solve their or meet their computing challenges. And that kind of sums up where this small revolution behind the scenes is going on behind these very prominently revolutionary scientific projects. Of course, that's all bobbins, isn't it? Because um, the other thing that's going on around the world is this. That is the cost to sequence a gene, or um, sequence the human genome. And I guess that we remember how big it was that uh, the first human genome was sequenced and how many years it took to do that and we forget how short a time ago that was and now we think well look at how cheap this is now this is a logarithmic scale from a hundred million dollars um, 17 years ago to about a thousand dollars last year and this is where the action is in terms of data so I mean, the physicists have had it had a good run of it now for a long time, and um, and they certainly think that big data is a physics problem, but um, not like these guys. So this happened yesterday. The uh, the NHS and Genomics England completed the hundred thousand genome sequencing project in the UK. So now they have the uh, the DNA of a hundred thousand patients in Britain, and they're going to use this in quite transformative ways to understand a good deal more about the nature of genetics and how that influences illnesses and, and afflictions and so on. This obviously is the new data deluge. It is going to be absolutely massive and when you look at the graph and the trend of it, it is certainly not stopping yet. So when we go to OpenStack summits and the like, what we see is that there's, in, the, in among the scientific group within the summit, which is probably about a, a quarter of the users of OpenStack now, well over half of those are in genomics and life sciences now. And the physicists, while they have huge scale and they've been running for longer, they are a much smaller pr uh, proportion of the science use cases. And what's interesting is, I mean, this is a, um, a project that we've been involved in with uh, Genomics England indirectly, again via Cambridge University. This is a machine, this is an application stack that's going to be used in the processing of Genomics England's 100K genome data, data bank. And there's a lot of stuff in here that might be familiar to people who are writing, um, um, you know, web based applications, but also a lot of stuff that is um, uh, far more aligned with the um, high performance computing environment. And it brings it all together in this multi-service, not exactly microservice, but multi-service application architecture. 
we've been working on bringing this into a special kind of OpenStack environment and deploying and building the whole thing using tools like Docker, Kubernetes, and Ansible as well. So there's definitely some problems here. So OpenStack is not really made for scientific computing. It just happens to fit the model quite well. But there are definitely things about scientific computing which are what they call the black swan events. It doesn't happen very often on Amazon that every single instance in the cloud is terminated and then rebuilt at the same time. Um, it doesn't often happen on Google that one user owns the entire deployment on a cloud. And it doesn't really happen on a Azure, Azure that the entire um, or the network could be susceptible to these synchronized flashpoints of communication congestion in the same way that a high performance computing simulation, a sort of bulk synchronous parallel ap application, can generate any of those things. So these use cases are not really like the kind of um, battery of web, web applications that, um, that are running in public clouds and, and stacked high to great effect. There are new challenges here. There are very, very difficult challenges to cloud infrastructure in order to function in this way. There are a lot of unsolved problems in this environment, but I think we're in the right city to be solving them because 40 years ago this week, there was the creation of this company in Moss. And I went to an event earlier this week to mark that. And actually, they traced the lineage of all of the, or many of the people who had worked in this company and how they came to be creating a good deal of the world beating technology that is has emerged from Bristol in the last 40 years. And this has really been, to my mind, one of the great sort of props of the technology ecosystem in Bristol today. Um, certainly around um, the sort of the low level technology, the fundamental technology, the sil silicon design, the system design. And uh, this man, Ian Barron, is the, uh, essentially the father of that whole effort. And he said, um, he said an interesting thing. He said the, uh, the strategy was that they'd employ bright young people, give them impossible tasks, and not actually tell them that what he was asking them to do was impossible. <laughs> and quite often, they would then achieve what had been asked of them. So I think this is actually a pretty good principle. And, um, and so I, I try and set impossible tasks for the, um, the people in our firm on a regular basis, as they know. Um, but one interesting thing is that our, our company, we're 10 people, uh, we contribute almost as much to OpenStack as AT&T does. We came ninth in total contributors in the globe. They were eighth. So a little firm in the right city can actually have a pretty powerful effect. And so I wanted to say a little soapbox moment about, um, about where we live in this cool town. Um, so in order to do difficult things, in order to take on difficult challenges, we just got to believe in ourselves. And um, I think amazing things are achieved here. And I think that a lot of those are achieved by, you know, the people here in this room. Everyone here, I expect, is working on something pretty cool. We are working on some pretty cool things too, and I've really enjoyed speaking about them, uh, about them with you. So uh, but we're looking forward to um, working with more inquisitive, techie people like you. So if, um, if you're interested in joining us, please get in touch. And thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> um, so all the talks have been recorded, so we just need to have the microphone. Um, thanks for the talk, very interesting. Um, I work for AT&T, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm You're happy. in our sights then. <laughs> well, we've only got 275,000 employees, so <laughs> I think you're winning them per person. Um, you mentioned the, um, uh, the high throughput fabric on the network side. Yes. Do you have any more information on, on what that is? Um, so we work with, well, we work with several machines which have different fabrics. Uh, essentially, the full range of um, uh, the fabrics that are available today. So uh, we have um, uh, two projects live running OmniPath, Intel OmniPath, which is the 100 gig 
um, InfiniBand like fabric. Uh, there's a couple of activities around 100 gig and 56 gig InfiniBand and integrating those into a, a cloud-like environment so that we get you know the nice properties of segregation and isolation and dynamic network creation in an InfiniBand uh, subnet. Uh, but I think a lot of the um, uh, the popular choice is, is around high-speed Ethernet. So um, there are some very interesting offload capabilities in Ethernet networking, in particular where um, where sort of high-performance uh, um, network protocols, software protocols, can be run inside of a VM and get the speed of the of the, the line speed of the Ethernet uh, beneath them. So we did a um, a very nice study with 100 gig Ethernet and um, and Mellanox uh, Connect X5 uh, NICs, and they have um, they do this uh, these smarts where you can actually embed the Open V switch from the hypervisor as flow rules into the into the silicon of the network card. So there's a direct um, path from the VM onto the wire, but shaped using SDN tape capabilities as though Open V switch had touched the packets in the hypervisor. So a bit of everything really, and. Um, um, if there was another performance fabric that I was aware of, I'd be, uh, I'm sure we'd be interested in running on that too. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, you talked a bit about the um, genome project generating a lot of data against kind of physics experiments. What kind of data, how much data are they generating? And what kind of, um, what kind of predictions do you have in that area? Oh, I was fearing this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sorry. There is there is a graph that I looked for quite a lot, uh, which I'd seen previously, which is the the classic hockey stick kind of graph of um, um, estimating um, genomics data sets and and how much they would be using. I couldn't find it. Sorry, but uh, I mean there there is some fascinating things. I mean, uh, um, uh, about this time last year, I was talking with some people from. Um, the eMedLab project at uh, the Crick Institute in London, and they were moving their their deployment, or they moving some data from one site to another, and it took uh, four weeks to to download the the entire data set. They actually have tools for data movement uh, specific to genomics. I don't know why, but they have this thing called Gene Torrent, which um, um, <laughs> probably does what it says on the tin. But um, I, I don't know why they have to have a special one, but uh, but they do. Yes, it is. Clearly, the the um, the gravity of the data is getting quite large, and actually, uh, they have to think quite carefully about where they where they place it initially, because moving it afterwards is going to be very expensive. I've got a couple of quick questions. First of all, the um, data acceleration. Uh, you said it got to 94% of uh, the 100% if it had been done directly on the storage. Was that under load or was that an isolated test? Um, so in this case, the, the benchmark for the raw case would be FIO on the raw block devices. Mm -hmm. um, and the benchmark for the file system case is that the file system is, for, the, the NVMEs are formatted with, um, I believe, XFS, and then BGFS, the um, parallel file system, is running on top of that. And then the application would be um, a parallel client application, and I think they use IOR, which is a, a, a standard parallel file benchmark. Thank you. And then the genome um, architecture, is that a hybrid one, or is it on-prem, cloud? What, 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 which route have they gone? Right, so currently the project is all done on bare metal. Um, and we're quite interested in, in creating essentially a hybrid deployment where the, uh, the service uh, the sort of the, the the middle layer, the APIs and so on, we virtualize those in order to get the um, uh, the density, and then we retain a lot of the um, the database performance on on bare metal, so that we have high IOPS onto onto um, direct devices. Uh, but but that, this is all done on premise at the moment. There there is no plan to do um, human genome data in, in public cloud. Um, there, there's a uh, I think Genomics England have a um, a dedicated ListX data center, which they which they use for the identifiable patient data, and a lot of the testing and so on is done with um, um, quasi-anonymized data. Thank you. 